Yes, I am so thrilled that you are here with us, either as a live viewer or watching the replay, because I have a feeling that many parents don't even get a draft IEP until the day before, or if you're lucky, a few days before your meeting. Is, is that true for you? Let me know in the comments. And I think also as a parent and an advocate, I would love to see IEP meetings be more collaborative and, you know, built on those trusting relationships. And what that means a lot of time is that we spend time before the IEP meeting even is there to have some conversations and discussions and bring the members of the school team and the parent, and if you have someone coming with you usually, but to start those conversations much even maybe months ahead of time. So when you get to the IEP meeting, it is really a positive experience. So if that sounds interesting to you, I would love for you to meet our guest speaker today. So you may know Amy, and I always have to like look at my cheat sheet, it's Plika. <laughs> Amy Plicka from New York. She is an educator, a parent, and also the founder of Universal Crossings, which is her company that she's formed. And she'll be talking about this wonderful framework today. And it's like, I'm like so excited about it. And I really hope that people will want to learn more and implement it in their school. So, Amy, Amy is here. She's going to be sharing a little bit more about herself um, as the PowerPoint goes through and we'll answer questions at the end, but keep your comments and questions coming so then we can respond to them. Um, Amy, welcome to yeah. our Facebook Live show. Thank you so much, Charmaine. I am beyond honored to be a guest on your show. I've followed you for a number of years now, so I really appreciate this time and our conversations leading up to this. It's been incredible. Um, so am I okay to start? Yes, yes. Okay. Let me bring up your PowerPoint here. And then as far as the chat, I can't see it. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I'm hiding it with my other screen. So if there's anything, please stop me. Um, if there's any questions that are timely um, and otherwise we'll have time at the end. It's not, um, I will not keep the full hour. <laughs> um, I will not keep this PowerPoint up the whole time. <laughs> so um, hello, welcome. Um, I just wanted to uh, open with this slide. This is really the quote that was the inspiration for the company. Um, education is all a matter of building bridges. It's from a gentleman uh, named Ralph Ellison. Um, and it, what I find is that uh, in my two decades of experience, there's all kinds of bridges to be built, bridges to be extended, bridges to be fortified, um, you know, knocked down, demolished, <laughs> try again kind of bridges um, in education. And everywhere I turn, you know, I, I find that um, I find myself kind of saying, these same certain phrases over and over again, or these same ideas keep coming up. And so I just couldn't hold it in anymore. And that's kind of why I started the company. Um, so I'm gonna walk through the services first, what, what I do and, and the history, history, it's only a few months old, <laughs> the history for the company, um, a little bit about me, and then we'll dive into student-centered presentations. And then I'll talk about a course um, that I've just launched as well. Cool. So, um, We'll have the introductory introductory information. Um, there's basically five big ideas for student-centered presentations. Um, and then of course, we'll go through the online course information. Um, so just so you guys know, I, I'm not an advocate. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> um, I'm just a, an educator and a parent I'm kind of trying to make a difference here. So I am... Um, I have two decades, uh, both in the classroom and out of the classroom uh, experience in general and special education. Um, I'm a general educator by trade, uh, and that's, you know, ironic, right? <laughs> um, so I want to bring people together in uh, general education to make a difference so that my, my experiences become the norm. So I was lucky enough to be hired into a truly 
uh, diverse school. Um, I was there for a little bit over 15 years and I was raised by some really um, powerful and inspirational uh, leaders. So I kind of came away from that experience with 10 ideals and you know, you'll see them here. I'll read them briefly. Um, I know that everyone belongs and everyone can learn. Students will rise to the occasion that speaks to our expectations of kids and presuming competence. Um, that idea of equity where fair is not always equal, we get what we need. And that's, you know, that's a conversation for me as an educator and a parent um, with, you know, other families, my administrators, my colleagues, um, and my son's team. Um, my first principle for number four, uh, there was no other option but to get to know your students and families and to include them in the planning. So family engagement was something I um, was exposed to, you know, right from the beginning of my career. Uh, number five, working collaboratively, um, you know, with families, with your colleagues, um, with your you know, related service providers um, to be responsive to student needs. Um, we know that students are not only variable as a whole, but they and I <laughs> vary day to day as well. So we need to expect that variability and be responsive to that. Um, no student is the same moment to moment. Uh, I'm really not the type of person to ever say no. So I'm always asking how do, how do you make something happen and not if. Um, and number seven, you guys who are familiar with co-teaching will appreciate this. I tend to use a lot of we, us, and our language. Um, this company is a departure from that because it is just me. It's a, it's a part-time company. Um, so I have to start using I and it's, uh, it's a little jarring for me. Number eight, we, we know as teachers and parents, we model what we wanna see in, your, in, in our words and actions always having a spirit of inquiry and reflection. You know, we can reflect and make changes and implement those, you know, next day if we need to. And I'm a really big fan of reassessing our use of resources to, to make sure that we are being um, responsive to students and families as well. Uh, so I'll jump to my services. So the services that I provide center around this, this big idea that, that you hear a lot in the field that all students are general education students first. And we know that some students, in addition to being general education students first, they receive other services to meet um, unique needs. So all of my product packages are intended to revolve around meaningful inclusion for all students, um, no matter if they're students with disabilities or not. Uh, and with that in mind, you know, I have all these like transformative kind of ideas and practices that I found are, you know, just they cross grades, they cross subject areas, um, and it enables classrooms and schools to be ready for all students. So I'm always looking um, carefully at how we construct the language that we use, our environments, and the strategies that we employ. So when we talk about the student center presentation, I really do harp on every single word that we use. I'm really careful um, so that we can kind of uh, promote that inclusive mindset. Um, and so with Universal Crossings, I wanted to fulfill this need of mine to share information far and wide to make an even bigger difference than I could um, in a school building or school district. Um, so who is this for? And it, it's, you know, I, it's a question that I am, I've had to struggle to answer. It's literally for everybody on the left um, and anyone I forgot to add on the left. Um, we need everybody at the table to make a difference. Um, you know, we know that system change doesn't happen without buy-in from all stakeholders. Um, and then on the side, I kind of talk about this idea of, you know, people's comfort level with inclusion. So it's the people that, you know, have misconceptions. I want to try to, you know, aim to reconfigure their thinking about inclusion if they think it may not work for everybody. Um, and then there's that middle group of, you know, people that are, you know, inclusive minded, but haven't jumped in yet. And then, of course, teams that have gotten in there kind of need to step back because maybe um, something's fallen off track. So uh, the three main areas of uh, products will be these student center presentations. This one, I, I feel like I kind of had ready, so it was easiest um, to start with this one. And then the personal and professional development would be those online courses, um, speaking engagements, things like that. And then um, curriculum consultation and redesign. So, you know, I know I've been handed curriculum over the, the 20 years and it doesn't meet the needs of, of my students at any given time, 100%. So I really like to help um, teams in school districts and buildings kind of look at what they um, want to put in place so that no matter what curriculum that they purchase, they can meet the needs of, of all kids that come through their doors. Um, again, I say this a lot, my, my 
services are pretty flexible. I try to meet people where they are. Um, I don't have any pre-made PowerPoints or slide decks um, except for this one right now. So, you know, as people come my way, I kind of develop things, uh, you know, with them, with all the resources that I have. Um, and then it's a sustainable business in, in two ways. I look, um, I'm, I am remote, I'm paperless, I'm borderless. Um, so that way it's environmentally sustainable. And then uh, this idea of capacity building. So if I can build, uh, you know, all the, the capacity of people around the IEP table and in general in special education, then that becomes more sustainable rather than, you know, someone um, waiting for someone to come in and kind of do it for them. I want to do it with um, school staff and families. That way it's uh, a lasting change. Um, is there anything in the chat, Charmaine, before I go um, on? Let's see. Let me look. So Angela is here and she says, we have a very collaborative team and I can pretty much write my daughter's IEP and they agree. I don't know what I don't know, though, and I'm not an educator, so I stress over what I may be missing. Mm -hmm. Yes. we. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think that's so true. I know. I know. Yeah. And. And um, Christy's here from Illinois, and Marie's here from South Carolina. And um, if we have time at the end, Angela, remind me, because I have a comment that I was just talking to my husband about as far as um, having the team agree with, like, the draft language that the parent gives. So remind me at the end, Angela, or I can come back later and type that in. But, yeah, we're doing great. And Kelly's here from Illinois. Great. All Just right. Say, Hi, Amy. <laughs> oh, 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 yes. So this must be the Kelly I know. <laughs> I know. That's I'm, I'm so glad they're here. All right. So again, it's I, I don't want to do anything cookie cutter. That it, that has never been my style. And I also want to help uh, shift that paradigm in schools as well, so that um, you know that's something that that doesn't uh, become a child's experience anymore. Um, so let's dive into the story behind these student center presentations. So this is new for me. Um, I've never come across something like this when I did some, I'm calling it market research. It wasn't really that fancy, <laughs> um, but I don't find anything like this. And so it was really hard for me to craft the language to make this clear um, for the, you know, the people that I want to serve and support. So I'll tell you the story. <laughs> and then at the end, if there's questions that you have um, after I go through the, the process um, and like what it is, um, we can kind of dive in a little bit because your questions actually help me to craft my language a little bit better. Um, and in fact, when I did coffee talks um, a couple of months ago, one of the questions I said, did the title match what you thought you were coming for? Because I, I'm trying to nail it down and, and it's a uh, it's new. It's different. It's tricky, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so with twenty years in education, um, let's take out five years on the personal side, and I've spent probably thousands of hours at this point building my own capacity about inclusive ed. Um, I think it was Angela. You know, I, I agree. I don't know everything, and I have a library of books that I am, you know, starting to tap into. And I'm, you know, I have to stop buying things because um, <laughs> there's so much to digest. And and I'll I'll come back to that at the end because I have something I'm trying to start for the fall as well with you guys. Um, so I'm a general educator. Uh, people laugh when I say this, but I did not come into teaching because I'm, I'm putting this in laughing quotes because I love kids or love to color or love to babysit or love to play school. I never did those things. I'm just really passionate about equity. And I knew um, from being a career changer, this was the place to, to start in elementary education. Um, I've always enjoyed supporting all the learners that have been in my room. Um, when I was in uh, the classroom, only two of those years were co-taught with a co-teacher, but I think me having, you know, a wi the widest variety imaginable of students in front of me, I've, you know, got a lot under my tool belt. And then I come to find that some of the things um, actually are evidence-based practices. So these are the things I want to spread. I know that's not the norm. I know um, sometimes general educators sometimes get a bad name in the inclusion community. Um, and I have never been one of them. So sometimes I do take offense, but I, I try not to. So I've gotten a little pushback um, around inclusion from all different, you know, parents, um, educators, administrators, um, general ed, special educators, anyone. And it's just a matter of, um, you know, producing some evidence and uh, strategies. So uh, I started creating this uh, slide deck for my son's meetings. And mm -hmm. I was sharing my work with local families and they they would always say, you know, can I have this please? Or you need to share this. And so I just felt like with all the time that I've spent 
I really uh, can't hold it to myself any longer. Um, and, you know, our current crisis in the, you know, with the coronavirus kind of just allowed me to, to have some time to do this. So I launched this as a part-time business in addition to my full-time job. And I chose this as the first product to tackle. Um, it's one of many topics. Some of them are around teaching and learning and, and some will be around um, more inclusive education um, as an isolated topic, let's say. So every year I update the slide deck uh, that I use and I, I try to keep the most current information and resources. So, you know, if I find something that's on um, behavior two years ago, I revisit it and I look for new things around behavior. And then I kind of vet, re-vet those again and say, well, what things do I like the best? Um, and does this thing that I used to have in the slide deck still reflect my current thinking um, as, a, as it evolves? So this, this slide deck is meant to be um, like the IEP, it's a living document. Right now, um, it's 25 slides, actually. I've had it to 20, and now it's 25. I've got 75 to 80 um, hyperlinked resources, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and so as far as making things more collaborative, like um, Charmaine did a great job of introducing this, um, I feel like once I started sharing this information in advance with the team, we've had more collaborative, thoughtful, and smooth meetings. Um, for me, the thing that was uh, scariest about being at the IEP table were, were surprises. You know, I don't know, um, it's either something I'm saying that they're, the team is hearing for the first time or something that another team member is saying that I'm hearing for the first time. Um, so we've been able to avoid that. And in brackets, I have their 25 minute video. This is something that happened in the past year. Um, in January, this past year, I shared uh, my slide deck with the team nice and early, um, you know, because there is there is nothing that says you can't meet and have conversations before your annual review meeting. Um, and so, you know, we know educators have to talk to each other about, you know, a student. And so we can be part of the conversation, too. And in fact, we can initiate the conversation. Um, and that's where I felt like as a parent, I could um, get that information. If I can get that information to them early enough um, and reach out to collaborate on the IEP uh, that might work uh, where the meeting's a little more smooth. And in fact, um, our meeting uh, was, I don't know, just a little bit under an hour. And this is an annual review for a student with extensive support needs. And people are like, how on earth did you do that? We have three hours and we're reconvening and all this because <laughs> conversation just kind of goes awry. And so the work was already done. We sat at, at the, in the Zoom, I was gonna say at the table, we sat at the Zoom. Um, I was able to show a 25 minute video um, about my current thinking, for, you know, that it has Norman Kuhn, Shelley Moore, you know, a bunch of other big names in inclusion. Um, and then the last half an hour was kind of just dotting the I's and crossing the T's at our meeting. And, you know, did we forget anything? Does everything align? Um, did we make sure everything in the present levels was addressed somewhere else? Um, and one of the staff members was like, wow, this was the one of the easiest annual review meetings. And it, I wasn't nervous coming into this meeting. And, and that was a first for me. Um, and my, my guy's a little guy. <laughs> so I'm, you know, I'm aiming to teach people how that worked. Um, and just the, the little ins and outs, you know, was every team member equally excited? <laughs> like, you know, as I was, not so much. Um, but we made it work. And, you know, there's different avenues to approach it. Um, and, you know, I, I, I can't, I come from a place of being vulnerable and open. And so that kind of has to be returned. Um, yeah, and it just seems like a dream IEP meeting, right? I mean, like when you're really, you know, there, focus on the child, you've already spent some time in conversation about the nitty gritty details of the IEP, but then you come back and it's like you have this nice closing mm -hmm. <laughs> to that discussion. Mm -hmm. And again, you use that as an opportunity, like you said, to share some video snippets from Norman Kuntz, Shelley Moore, mm -hmm. you know, different people that you can share. And you can actually use that IEP meeting time to show teachers like what this picture of inclusive ed is so i just i just like when i visualize this kind of a meeting it's like ah i would love to go to one of these <laughs> you know versus kind of the confrontational ones that sometimes we're invited to come to as an at least for myself <laughs> when I'm an advocate, you know? <laughs> yes that's but, part of you know what i i when i um talk a little bit one of the things that 
also pushed me to start putting this out there for other people is that I, I do see on social media, it, it, things are, are really reactive and it doesn't have to be that way. You know, I, I find, you know, I see posts where someone will say, oh, my IEP meeting's tomorrow. What, what advice do you have about inclusion? <laughs> no, like, please, you know, and I want to start typing and I'm like, I can't, like, it's, it's so much, right? Um, and it's the same thing, like, you know, you let's say, let's say the bridge is, is severed or there are bricks missing from the bridge that need to be repaired. You know, there's a, there's, I think there's ways to come around it on the proactive side that can kind of uh, mend those things over. Um, you know, of course, I know, I know there's a time and place for, you know, mediation, due process, I get that. Um, but really, that's that that does have um, a really negative effect on that long term relationship you have with the school district. So if you can avoid that at, at all costs, that's, that's my aim, right? Is to, you know, they're going to be caring for, for my child and other people's kids, um, you know, while everyone's at work and the whole school day, they spend a lot of time there. So, you know, we want everyone on the same page and, and, you know, feeling comfortable and proactive. And like you said, coming to the IEP meeting for the annual review to celebrate and just reconnect at the end and say, great, we did it, you know? Yeah. 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 What a concept. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So this, um, so this, slide deck that I have is is meant to be this repository for the entire team that we revisit often. We use it in IEP development. It literally helps to inform the sections of the document to make sure that it is really individualized and meaningful for the student and the family. Um, I've seen quotes that say, you know, a good IEP can make a, or an IEP can make or break a family's, um, you know, life, <laughs> um, you know, really could set up a kid for success in the long run um, or gets in the way of it. Um, and just like the IEP, it's a living document. It grows with the learner. You know, eventually as kids get older, of course they make it their own. That becomes, you know, more of a student-led um, process, right? And then we're kind of the guide on the side, just like the teachers would be as well. Um, I do want to clarify, because I've gotten this question a lot. It's, you know, we're, this is juicy content. We're not just sending this or dumping it or, or turning it over to the school, but this is something that, you know, we initiate um, and then we utilize it and revisit and revise it over time together where, you know, my dream is to have the team kind of come up with things that could be in this PowerPoint as well. Um, what it does is, uh, let me just get to the next. Yeah. So there's five big ideas, right? So we're talking about um, communicating that clear and then some, I keep editing it in different places, but that inclusive vision, um, that's, we're also setting it with that, the tone of collaboration and sharing of values and, and things that are important to us um, as a family unit. Um, and then it's also to promote self-determination. We'll dive into that. Keeping things child-centered, share that unique and valuable information, all those resources that I'm talking about, all those vetted uh, materials, and then using the, the slide deck to create opportunities for collaboration. Um, so there's a lot of pathways to make something like this happen. And I, I just want to clarify a couple of differences here. So it's not necessarily yet a student-led IEP document. The student, you know, depending on their age um, and want, you know, or desire to be involved, you know, pre-transition age um, can have bits and pieces in here. And I'll show you where they can have a little voice, um, you know, as early as, you know, preschool. Um, so there's this large slide deck, but then a lot, I know a lot of people have one sheeters that, that serves a different purpose, right? So that's where I might take the slide deck and then the IEP that we create and bring those together to, to put everything into a one sheeter for the team. So that would have the, the heavy hitting topics like um, what to do and what not to do, you know, in case a substitute comes in, what are all the list of goals just to kind of keep that in the forefront for the team um, or a substitute or um, special area teachers like gym and music. Um, and then there's this vision board, right? That would be a, you know turning over a lot of the control to the, to the student. So, um, I just want to let you know that I know that there are different options. I just find that this one serves uh, its a unique purpose. And so I, I kind of want you to look at it that way, where it's um, not just it's different than what we may have seen in the past or what um, we may have created in the past. Um, so when we talk about this clear, inclusive lens, um, so we're thinking about what language we can use to create the vision, the vision statements for this process this is about three slides 
Um, there's a long-term lens, and then there are all the detail statements that go with it. So the detail statements that are related to the long-term lens, like all the WH questions you can answer when you try to envision the child's future or when the child is envision envisioning their own future. Um, it has, you know, things like what type of human are we looking, you know, to send out into the world um, when they graduate? Um, what skills and competencies will they have? What options and opportunities will be open for them? Um, and then underneath that, so this will kind of be like the, the third slide, uh, would have like language about the educational journey. So we know that in the scheme of things, you know, this school age experience is kind of short lived. Um, so we want to make sure that there are things in there that we talk about as far as the kids education that align with the long term lens. And like I said before, the language is really, really important um, to make sure that we're uh, setting up for success and all the proactive things that, rather than um, something that might kind of come back and snag us later on. Um, and then from here, that becomes our compass. That is the bridge. I talk a lot about bridges. That's the bridge from here, today, and now to the future. And we curate the words. We curate the materials. Um, we might have a slide that has videos of what we think would be a good um, thing to keep in mind for the long term. So if we're looking at Think College, then we put a link to a video, you know, connected with Think College. Um, so those are the, we're looking at images, videos, links. Um, I have a nice collection of those so far uh, that seem to meet a lot of families' needs. The second piece is um, self-determination. So we know that self-determination has multiple components. It's not just self-advocacy. So depending on what kind of checklist you're looking at, there could be like eight to 12 different components of self-D. Um, and here we're thinking about what language can be used to capture um, and empower the voice of the learner. So I'm not writing what I think I want the team to know about my kid who's not, you know, typing or, or speaking in, you know, big sentences yet. But what would he want the team to know about him? So I'm really trying to step back, take myself out of it and, you know, create some slides. There's four slides here um, written in the I voice um, from the child. Uh, and then what I'll do is like if I'm working as a, I've only, I've done a few where it's a one-on-one -on -one, um, consult for a family and I'll have them write the statements in the same way. And I'll, I double check and I'll say, is this your voice? Is this what you're saying? Or is this what a child would say, right? Um, so we're looking at, I'm a big fan of student empowerment across the board. Um, and then we're looking to have the student become more and more involved over time. So if we're capturing a video of a student that shows something that they would want to communicate or something that they love, then we link to a video of the, of the child. Um, you know, it doesn't need to just be text. Um, and eventually this does leave, lead to student-directed IEPs. I'm a huge fan of student-led parent-teacher conferences, um, giving students voice and choice in their educational journey so that there's buy-in, right? They, they need to feel like this is a place for them. Um, so again, that bridge is connecting back to the main person. It's not about me. It's not about anyone else on that team except for the student. Um, so that whole team gets to know the student, the good, the bad, the ugly, as the family feels comfortable. So I'm, you know, I'm, like I said before, I'm very um, vulnerable with the team. And I tell them I'm sharing this with you because I think it will help with how you work with my child, um, not because I expect it to come back or for you to, you know, comment on it or anything. So some of the things are not fun to share. Um, and we know for students without disabilities, a family would not have to disclose certain things. Um, so we just, we wanna make sure that we're being honest and, and open so that um, that bridge can connect between home and school. Um, in that category, uh, in this area, there's of course the strengths, the preferences, the interests that we're you know, gonna figure out ways to utilize. They don't just go in there as a feel good, you know, oh, my kid's really good at something. It's how are we gonna utilize this? Um, in the trainings that I, that I have online now, there's probably like six different ways that we can utilize strengths. Um, and then of course we have the needs, challenges and all the things that don't work because you know, maybe a child can't express that, but they will certainly react and let you know when it doesn't work. So you wanna help the team avoid that and um, be proactive themselves in avoiding things that may, um, you know, trigger a student or have a student become disengaged. Um, so there, there's probably four other, four other uh, components here. 
Um, and then I have, I do have a slide also on the family perspective. So I, I do need to get my voice in there because I can't help myself. Um, so I'll, I'll say like the biggest things for me about my kid are these things um, and then how they kind of link with education. Um, I'll, one thing I will step aside and say um, from the PowerPoint, something I feel strongly about is this idea of strength. So we talk about having um, a strengths-based lens or an asset-based lens. Um, we talk about you know, telling the team and making sure they understand all the things that our, our, our little person or big person can do um, so that, you know, they get credit for it basically, right? So if the team doesn't see them being able to do it, but I know they can, I'm gonna try to capture that, um, whether it's a, in an image or a video or something um, to share. So, and that's important because they need to leverage those strengths. And, you know, in the training that I, the online course, I have this six or eight different ways that we can use, really use the strengths. Um, not just to have me sit at the IEP table and feel like, oh, they noticed that my son is cute. Okay, it, it has right. to go past that, right? So what, how are we gonna use this cuteness, right? Um, but the thing that I, I wanna just caution against is that some, we don't want that to backfire, right? So if we're talking, when we talk inclusion, and Charmaine and I connected on this <laughs> uh, along with many other topics, um, recently, you know, it, it could backfire later if, if we're using those strengths or those can do items to justify a placement in an inclusive setting. Um, there are no, we know there are no prerequisites. Um, you know, there's no checklist um, to be in an, an inclusion setting to be learning in the general education classroom. So just be careful because we know, you know, for certain kids, certain disabilities, the gap will widen. And so if that idea of, um, you know, a child, you know, knowing all their letters, is used to open the door for inclusion. Well, when the gap widens, it's, you know, we don't want it to be used to now shut the door for inclusion. Well, now the gap's too wide. Um, so just, it, that's my little cautionary thing because you see it happen. Well, and 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 I was telling um, Amy the other day that, I mean, this happened to me this spring with a little guy that's gonna be going into kindergarten next year. And, um, if you look at his records, there's like significant medical, you know, physical needs that he has. And what happened is people just kind of wrote him off and it's like, no, he's going to go over here to this other school where they have this self-contained class. And I found myself saying, you know, but you get to know him and you understand that he is just this kid that is so interested in learning. He loves playing with his peers. And I'm on and on about all his strengths. And as I'm saying that, I'm going, Charmaine, this is not about just including cute kids that know how to behave and know their letters, right? Because then if my son comes along and he doesn't know all those things, can I still advocate for inclusion? And I can't believe those things came out of my mouth, but it happens. And um, we all make those, the, you know, and it's also like an ableist thing, right? It's like, if you're at this level, oh, then we can include you. And I mean, that is not at all what I stand for. So, but it's, somewhere inside of me because those words mm -hmm. came out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is a great caution. I yeah. have a caution tape somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> I tape. love your props. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I think we, we, um, it's information, right? If they can do something that, you know, now if I inherit that IEP as a teacher, I know where to start. Right. That's the most basic reason why I want to know what a kid can do, right? There's so many other things that, that I'm going to do with that information, but you know, that's at minimum, you know, that's fine. You know, I just, I always go back to this idea as, and I'm saying this as a general educator, whoever comes at my door, I need to figure out where they are, you know, and, and the more information I can get early on, the better, right? So I can, I can hit the ground running with the, with the student, not waste their time, right? Right. So the next part, uh, this was really important to me. This is probably the reason why I initiated uh, doing something like this. Mm -hmm. I get, I'm sweating now. My hands are sweaty now. <laughs> I get clammy. I start shaking. Um, I had to have a friend come with me and hold my leg down <laughs> in, in one of the first meeting coming from early intervention to preschool. Um, you know, so for me, <laughs> um, it calms my nerves and my emotions. It's, That's you know, huge. I've been on every angle of an IEP table. Um, and, you know, it, it 
really is um, jarring to sit as a parent. And even if everything's going okay, you still are nervous. And, you know, you know, it's your kid, you feel like every decision matters. And, um, you know, it may or may not matter, right? Because you always revisit everything. So it just, it, that was probably the main reason I need something to lean on. And so that way I could feel more confident that like, if I get nervous, I'm just going to take my sweaty hands and get to the, you know, pr- back then I was printing out the PowerPoint. Um, and cause we didn't have a, a, a screen in the room where the meetings are held and I was making binders for everybody. So that became, you know, of course it was something to lean on, but then it also became cumbersome where I couldn't just locate the resource I needed right away. Um, and then among some other reasons, you know, we're thinking about how can we keep things focused on the student, right? That's one. If I'm too nervous or too emotional, things derail and, and that's on me. So it, it controls me. <laughs> um, and then it helps us keep focus on that long-term vision, framing everything around the students. Um, we can come back to certain you know, language in the slide deck. Um, and then, like I said before, it creates that that more meaningful IEP process, if we can kind of plant it in the right sequence of events, I think. Um, And it allows for the student and the family voice to be well represented because as an educator, I'm sitting on the other, you know, sitting on the other side of the table, I do have a lot of information about the child. And I feel like, you know, I did dominate some of the meetings because I wanted to tell everything I knew about the kid and, and, and it was good stuff, you know, and where I think we can go next. And, but the and families shy away because maybe I'm using lingo they they didn't quite get or it, it flew over there. It's too many things at once, you know. So I feel like it kind of slows things down. It allows it to be a more balanced uh, conversation. Um, and you know, I'm certainly as a, as a parent, I don't know all the lingo that they're using in OT and PT. So they'll say things, and I'm like, okay, write that. However, you're gonna write that. <laughs> what does it mean? You know. Um, so it just kind of it refocuses everybody and and slows uh, slows it down a little bit. Um, like I said before, it's also bringing it back to um, resources and information that uh, comes back to the student. So, you know, of course, there's certain things that are about inc- inclusive education that are across the board. But then there's certain things, depending on a disability, that we might want to highlight or um, a video that might capture something that, you know, one family likes and it, it reflects their vision and it may not reflect another family's vision. So there's that I, I keep I keep using the word curate because um, that's what I want this document to be for folks um, as it is for me. And then, of course, it's this idea of, of celebrating the child, you know, and that's what that annual review should be. Everything that, that we come together, it's been a you know, long year, um, aside from COVID, and we celebrate what we've done. And, and if the kid is there, we want to make sure that they're seeing that happen, too. Um, you know, the earlier we know you can get kids involved in their own meetings, you know, for five minutes, 10 minutes to come and sit, introduce people, whatever they're going to do, or lead the whole meeting, it keeps a focus on that celebration. So, you know, there's there's something to look forward to. Um, so on the next, uh, this becomes the, probably one of the most important pieces to the slide deck. Um, I have about 15 dedicated standalone slides on inclusive education. So covering a wide variety of topics, I have all the citations, um, a bunch of permissions from different organizations and researchers and things. Um, And then at the end, there's two separate slides. One has all hyperlinks to organizations and websites uh, that you can just go on that I think are just tremendous no matter what resource you pick. And then uh, another one is all uh, text that I think are really um, critical in, in inclusive education. Interspersed throughout, uh, so let's say there's um, the vision. So I might have, you know, hyperlinked images, videos, articles, uh, blog posts, opinion pieces, research, infographics, um, all the vetted resources that I feel like match what I'm trying to say. Um, and just to show that, you know, other people feel the same way. It's nice to see something that kind of mirrors, like Charmaine's book for me, <laughs> kind of mirrored, you know, I was reading, I was like, yes, yes, yes. Um so we think about what are the items that we can share with the team to communicate, A, what's in your heart and soul and, and your kids, but also what's in our toolbox. So as, as we, we always say, the family knows the kid the best, right? You live with your kid, you have them for so many years and, and hours in the day, you know a lot. And so how do you bring that to life for the team without just talking, right? How can you show them? Um, so like I said, it's dedicated slides, but then also interspersed uh, depending on the topic. Um, there, it can kind of also capture 
the family's current thinking around disability overall, because we know everybody's at, at a different place um, and a different, you know, what type of language you want to use. Do you want person first? Do you want identity first? Um, you know, so it, all those things are going to matter. And that's your place to um, illustrate and show those things. Um, and then again, it's the bridge connecting to action. So I like to say to the team, I said, so we have all this information. We know there's all this evidence. I know it and you know it. So how are we going to get this going? Now it's not the if, it's how. How are we going to refine what we've already been doing? How can we make it work better and better? Because, you know, even today, I don't have the perfect IP. You know, I, I've never seen one. But I know that we're at a really good starting point. Next year we can and uh, infuse some other ideas that, that I'm holding on to, right? I'm not going to, you know, go, you know, toe to toe on every little thing. That's not, that's not the point. If the IEP is working and it's meaningful, you know, we're, we're good. <laughs> um, but then over time we can start to evolve that and make it even better. Uh, the last part about the PowerPoints is this idea of collaboration. So here we're making sure that in, in the slide deck there, there's language in there that helps to build relationships or repair, disconnect and enhance meaningful partnerships. So as I present it, let's say there's something about presuming competence. I might stop the, you know, and talk to the team about how I noticed that one of the team members really did that with my kid that year or the student that we're talking about at the table. Um, just so that there's, it's careful, it's thought out. Um, you know, we're making sure that we're acknowledging everyone's strengths that they bring to the table as well as experts um, in all the areas, you know, whether it's being a parent or a professional. Um, and then again, those are this, these types of things, you can have a slide on collaboration if you like, and, and that's something we can talk about, or can that language can also be interspersed throughout. Um, again, please don't forget, it's that relationship you have with, um, you know, between the home and school, it's, it's long, <laughs> it's a long term, <laughs> you're, in, you're in it with them, unless you're moving around every year, right? So you want to make sure that things are smooth, that, that there's a feeling of, um, you know, positive intentions at the table and, and, you know, understand where everyone's coming from. So we know the research on family engagement um, shows that kids do better. So if we can help start that, start that uh, with the team, then, then let it come from, it doesn't matter who it comes from, does it? Um, and then we talk about communication, the homeschool communication. So what was really cool about our meeting is, um, you know, sometimes there's like the sheet that's always been used or the notebook and you get it at home and you're kind of like, okay, this is good. I can see they've put effort into it, but it doesn't tell me what I need to know. So I don't want that waste. You know, I said, I don't want you to waste paper. I don't want you to waste this checklist. You know, let's make something, you know, useful. And so, you know, the teacher stopped and said, well, why don't we create it together? You know, why don't we yeah. come at the end of August and kind of say, like, what is it that you want to know about your kid's day, right? Whether they can or you can't tell you about their day. So that's a place that could be a slide onto itself about homeschool mm -hmm. communication and, and your openness to collaborate on how that might go and to change it if it's not working for one or the other. Um, it can't be too cumbersome as a, a gen ed teacher, like it, it really can't eat up your day. Um, and it, but yet it has to capture what, what the family needs to know. Um, and then of course it's that bridge of support. So I'm here to support, um, the school team. The school team is here to support me as a parent. Um, so we want to make sure that, that, that message is really clear. Um, and like I said before, you're curating that whole, um, all the words that you use. Um, so basically I, I'll stop here. Um, I kind of hope that I'm capturing the why this is something that's really useful. Um, Charmaine had me think about the what, like really describing what it is. Um, and it's hard because I'm living in it. My head's wrapped up in it. So it's hard to step back and say, what is this? <laughs> um, and then the how is, is what I'm trying to build people's capacity around in the course. So first I was like, all right, it's a kitchen sink course. <laughs> I'm going to give you literally everything. So I'm going to walk you through the course options and then we can, um, we can stop sharing and then, and chat. Cool. Um, I started with this premium one and I was like, I'm throwing everything in there. You will literally get to see the PowerPoint I've made for myself and other families. Um, you'll have three hours of live coaching. You'll have all the printable worksheets. You'll have the slide decks, you know, as PDFs, um, I tried to offer some, you know, discounts and things like that. Um, cause I want, I, for that amount and all the work that it's taken, I, I want people to literally have it all and take it and run with it. Um, and then I started thinking and people were like, well, I already have a PowerPoint, so I don't know that they'd need all of this. And I started thinking, all right, let's differentiate, right? Isn't that what we would do as teachers? Um, so I just added two more 
uh, this morning. They're kind of skeleton-like, <laughs> um, and they all are launching on August 2nd. So I'm kind of doing it as a three-week challenge um, just to get ready for the fall. Uh, there's an on your own course. So all that does is take away the live coaching. So you still get all the forms, you have all the PowerPoints, and I'll, I'll be recording when little guy is asleep. Um, you'll get the slide decks as well. And then the total DIY thing is just if you can hear what I'm saying, and you feel like you're in my head right now, you could just get the printable worksheets that can guide you in your own um, process. Then there's this um, one sheeter that I use. Um, just kind of give a little bit of background information about what it is. You can just email me for that. I'm on uh, the link tree. There's a form. Um, if you want me to just make it for you, <laughs> um, you have you have it in mind. So what we do with that is um, I, I talk to you first about what it looks like. I walk you through um, some of the categories, um, get your input uh, on this form because I don't know I don't know everybody's child. So I'll take all the information, I'll make the slide deck, and then we go over it and I kind of show you where things are. Um, with that, you know, with all of it actually, you know, it's really up to people to study. It's up to the team to study it. Um, you know, it, it was up to me to study and read these documents again and again. If I, if I found something that didn't resonate with me, I took it out. Um, I don't want to put across anything to the team that just says include kids all the time. And then it says these other things um, inside that are horrible and that I don't agree with. So we have to be really careful. So I'll walk you through what's in there, but then you also have to vet it for yourself and you can let me know this doesn't work. This, you know, I'd rather use this resource and we could swap it out. Um, and then, of course, if you already have a presentation or you did one through any of the kind of on your own or DIY things, um, I can provide feedback. So you can send me the PowerPoint, give me some questions you have or things that you're wondering about. I could review it and then we can set up a, um, a brief consult to kind of go over where I think you might head next. Um, and then the last slide, um, I because I'm so... I'm trying to wrap my head around all the most recent information and, and to um, make sure that I'm not uh, missing anything that's come out in the last you know, decade, let's say, when it comes to inclusive ed. I'm starting uh, in the fall an inclusion club. So it'll kind of be like, um, it's like a book club, I would say. So like a monthly subscription. Um, and then we would break down some of the resources together. So it's literally kind of complements your slide deck. Uh, plus some new stuff that I haven't looked at yet in order to decide if I would like to include it in my slide deck or not yet either. So there's books, there's articles, we can look at websites together. Um, so what I'll do each month, this this is my my goal, what I'll do each month is kind of come up with um, a little slide deck on, on a resource that we talk about beforehand. So we pre-plan what we're going to look at. I'll, I'll review the things, you review the things, I'll make a little slide deck, then we have a conversation. Does this resonate or not? Um, and then we plan for the next one. So that's kind of my goal for the fall. Um, and that is my final slide. It was a little longer than my half an hour presentation. I okay. <laughs> no, you're fine. I think that's good. And um, I just love the personalization and the, you know, just the positiveness of the framework that you've developed. And I really hope that more parents and educators, right? I mean, it would be great for teachers to look at this and say, this is a different way we can, you know, do our IEP meetings. Yes. Um, so I just put the link, your tree link in the comments. And we did have a couple of questions. So Anne-Marie asked, are you using this slide deck during the meeting? Mm, good question. Uh, sometimes and sometimes no. <laughs> so um, the only thing I used it for this year was um, that one video. So I showed them where it was um, little by little as we have, you know, our monthly, I'm trying to aim for monthly check-ins where I reach out to them and say, how's it going or every six weeks or something. Um, and then it just kind of depends, it'll, it'll depend on the conversation. So if we're having things like, you know, um, post-COVID behaviors <laughs> that, you know, re-entering <laughs> society, I guess. Um, I'm sure things are going to pop up. So there's, you know, some resources there. So I, I, I look at it as like the repository. They have it. They can look at it on their own. You know, I've already spoken to the building principal. We've talked about possibly him using it in some of the professional development um, when they have like team meetings and things internally. I don't need to be there for that. Um, I did speak to the superintendent about it. So we're going to um, look at it together. He's interested in the idea of changing the way the meetings go um you know and I, and I think um I think it's just kind of having people step back and say like well how's that going for you <laughs> you know how are things and and then providing the resources that help them get to the next step um, right. 
you know, I, I see um, as far as, you know, coming up with goals, I have a whole slide on standards based goals, um, which is really important to me as well. Um, so we look at state standards together and I could say, I know them too. <laughs> I've read them too, right? <laughs> I'm teaching or I haven't seen the new ones that have come out in our state, you know, as a teacher, I'll, I know them, you know, and, and I can say this language is in there too. Let's look. Um, right. It is, you give it to them, they have it. Um, but, you know, I'm not walking, I might've just walked them through the first time I met them and said, here's this thing I have that I'm going to be giving you each year and mm -hmm. updating um, and just kind of telling them what's in it. Uh, so then you kind of wait, you see what comes up. If you notice something's not going well, maybe you return back to the homeschool communication one. And there's, I think there's an article in there called um, what to do if your child can't tell you about their day, you know, and that's just to bring it back and, and reset, you know, because that is important and scary for families when their kid can't tell them. Right. Oh, Does exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so, and that's where I think, you know, depending mm -hmm. on your team, right. It's, mm -hmm. you know, maybe when you're meeting with the team before the IEP meeting, that might be you want to show a section about your child's strengths, if it's going to be a whole new team working with your child, mm -hmm. right? And I love what you had said earlier too, Amy, about connecting the strengths to actual instructional strategies. Mm -hmm. It's like nice to know that your kid, you know, excels at karate, but a lot of teachers are just going to smile and nod and like, oh, great. And it's like, no, like, think about this. If you're so good at karate, how can we use that at school when we're teaching him things? Um, and so I love that you have that connection because so many times I think it is just strengths. But yeah, so um, Anne-Marie, I think it depends on your team. Um, but like Amy said, at least they have that, you know, um, slide deck to refer to when questions come up and you also are comfortable because you know that you have vetted those resources mm -hmm. right um, and so let's see Kelly your friend from Illinois says how often do you find team members access the information you provide I find I worry about overwhelming or sending so much that they tune out it's just what I was thinking to, to add on to after Emery's question. Um, yes. <laughs> so I've had you know, some team members have said like, you know, we're good, Amy. Like we know this, you know, we're on board, we're trying. And I said, I need you to have this though, because you know, you may be on it, but maybe we're not speaking the same language when it comes to inclusion. Right. So I need you to know what it means to me, what it looks like to me. Um, and so, you know, there, there are sometimes misunderstandings and that's okay. Um, and then, it, you know, I wouldn't, what I wouldn't do is expect them to sit for a whole meeting and, and go through every single link with you. The PT might be sitting there. Why am I looking at standards based goals? Like there's no reason for it. So you pick and choose and you ask the team. I, I had to ask uh, two years ago. I said, you know, I know this is a lot. I said, do you want me to make a shorter version, you know, first? And she said, yes. So I cut out a couple of yeah. things and, you know, just slid that over to them. And then when the meeting came, I kind of gave them the full uh, piece. It, it, it just depends on where you are in the relationship, how comfortable you feel explaining it. You know, it's not intended, um, you know, like Charmaine said, it's like a dissertation. <laughs> it's not intended to make everybody, you know, a complete expert on every aspect of inclusive education at the table. It's kind of like a need to know basis or an as it comes up type of thing, but at least it's there. Um, for our team, you know, and, and they'll tell you and I'll ask them, tell me, like, stop me if this is too much, you know, tell me if you have a question. And, and you know, that's it's the same in the classroom. I would do the same for my students in the classroom, you know, check right. in check for understanding. Where are we okay. um, too much, too little, you know, want to take a break? You want to revisit this in November? Um, just I think it's just about being flexible. If you're if you want them to model being flexible with your kid and you <laughs> then we can be flexible with, with, with staff for sure. It's overwhelming. I can tell you for sure. It's a lot of work. I, and I didn't go into it uh, thinking about summers. I went into it thinking it would be it would never be boring. And, and that is true. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, very much so. And yeah. so let me pull up um, Anne-Marie's question. She said, yes. Um, her daughter's fifth grade teacher last year just admitted to me that the email and resources that I sent terrified her. I wasn't able to have an in-person meeting with her because of COVID, so I emailed it all. She ended up being the absolute best teacher ever for my daughter, despite that start. 
so cool. Isn't that wonderful? I, I'm trying to look for it so I can read it. I'm, I need to see and hear. I, that's, that is great. I think. Do you I, see oh, on the screen? Yes. Oh, I love okay. this program. Yes, I love your app. Um, yes, and that's how I am as a gen ed teacher. Like I, I wouldn't know what to do with my son in the classroom, but you know, my heart is in it and I'd be terrified and I'd try to figure it out and I'd ask the family <laughs> and I'd ask for support when I needed it. And that's, that's really, that's for me, what it came down to as a gen ed teacher. Um, you, no one, not a special educator, not a general educator, not an administrator, not a professor of any of those topics <laughs> knows everything about all the disabilities and every single child, because there's such a, a, a you know, every person's different, every kid's different. Um, so I think being scared is okay. And that, and I'll tell them I'm scared too. <laughs> I'd be scared if he was in a segregated placement. I'd be scared if he's an inclusive placement, you know, it, it's your, it's your kid. And, and a teacher like that is great. Cause they, you know, they want to do well, they want to do right by your kid. So that's great. Thank you. Sorry. I had this thing come up <laughs> on my phone. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think that's the thing is, you know, like you said, kind of individualizing things depending on your team. Um, but I think the other thing that's nice about that with all your hyperlinks is you have a variety of media, right? Mm -hmm. So some teachers are like, I really don't want to read an article, mm -hmm. but I would love to watch a video about inclusive ed and really get the picture of what it is. Mm -hmm. Or I don't really want to read an article or watch a video, but there's this podcast I could listen mm -hmm. to. So you've really incorporated those universal design for learning concepts. <laughs> Um, and so, and teachers can pick and choose, right? Um, and like you said, as needed, because we don't expect them to internalize all this information at once. Um, but when they have a question, they have a great resource in that slide deck to go to. Um, Got me thinking uh, two things. One, when I used to give the binder, I knew they weren't taking it home. They're not carrying the <laughs> binder home, but they could after dinner, maybe they're doing the dishes, click on the link and check out a video while they're cleaning up or, you know, when their kid goes to bed or on their way to work. And so I, I felt like it was, if it was useful for me, then, you know, it would have to be useful for them. And, you know, teachers do work out of hours for the most part. I mean, I, right. they, they want to know, you know, the other thing I would point out too is, um, you know, depending on their comfort level, you're right. They may just start with a video, but it's the same for me. If I'm researching a topic that I know nothing about and it's new and intimidating for me, but I'm expected to do it, I'm going to start with the easiest thing first. And we tell our students that if I, if you want to research turtles, you get the, you know, level A book on turtles. Okay. So you can get some background knowledge before you dive into the, you know, 50 page, um, you know, thing about turtle genetics, like you're not going to dive into that. And so you have the basics under your belt and, and that's okay. And that that's good. So there's, you know, the, that there is that range of things to, to check out as well. Oh, exactly. Mm -hmm. And Karen, hey, Karen, I'm glad you're here. She said, in your experience, what is an IEP team's reaction when they are sent this slide deck mm -hmm. by a parent that is not an educator? Aren't they going to say they're too busy to read all that and they have their own documentation? Yes. <laughs> and they do and they do. You know, I'm not I, I being on all the sides, they do. I know they do. Um so I you know, I, I think it's just it's just being um humble. And just saying, look, I've consulted because I care so much about this, right? It, you know, if you're not, you could say, I, I'm not an educator. And yet I've, I've reached out. This is my child. You know, really, it's, it's my life's work, right? This is the one thing that matters the most in the world to me. Um, so I needed to build up my own capacity about what's best. And we know from five decades at this point that in inclusive uh experiences get the best outcomes. We know this. That's part of the slide is, is, is all the research that goes behind it. It's every little thing, you know, it's social, it's academic, it's, it's, it's uh, income, you know, post-secondary experience, it's everything. So you can say like, you know, I came across this general thing and, and then I needed to dive in because I don't understand it. We didn't grow up this way. I, I really don't remember seeing kids with any significant disabilities in any of my classes ever. I know there was a little bus. That's all I know. I don't know where they went. I have no idea. And you can, you know, that's how the teachers grew up too, right? So right. this is, you know, we're not that far away from the inception of IDEA. 
but yet we know so much more now that, you know, we need to get further away from, from, from what it originally looks like. Right. And that continuum. Um, is that helpful? <laughs> oh, I think so. Yeah. Yes. Let me look. And um, Angela says, wow, this is great. <laughs> hey, Cam, she's from Iowa. She said, I love this. <laughs> um, and I think somebody else had a question up here. So let me go back. I think um, it was about your story that you were going to share. Where is it? Oh, I could do that. Let me. So Emory said that she has a binder with similar topics and information mm -hmm. about Down syndrome. I give the mm -hmm. team for the school year. I also mm -hmm. found an online binder to organize articles and PDFs yeah. to share with the team. Perfect. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's and I think maybe explain. So if people t um, enroll in your course, then then how do you, sh I mean, do you share like your list of these are the top websites I think of, you know, these are the books I recommend. So do you share that with the people so then they can also use that or how does that work? So I give a, um, well, it's, I'll say two things. Um, I give a top 10 or like a 10, it's not a top 10. It's a 10, I would say on different topics. So I may try to hit a few different topics. So in each of each, no matter what level you sign up for, you get those first 10 to kind of jumpstart okay. it. Um, what I'm doing, because it is somewhat, can I use the word proprietary? It's such a yeah. strange concept for me as a, an educator where you share everything, but as a business person, I'm trying, you know, it's like wrapping my head around this idea. Um, but it, it is for me. So in, in what I'll be doing in the premium course is in the live sessions, we will walk through the entire um, slide deck. So we will walk through all 25 slides. I'm breaking it up over the three sessions. Um, it's redacted. So you don't know who it's about. Um, I think maybe there's a, maybe a gender identifier, perhaps that's about it. Um, and you can tell it's a young person, but I'll walk you through the entire thing. I, I want to talk about in the live, it, cause it's hard for me to just give it without okay. saying like the reason why I worded it this way is because and I need you to understand like why, so that when you make your own, you start thinking about those things. Like, why would I word it this way and not say this? Or I've always heard it this way, but why isn't she saying it that way? Why is she saying this? Why did she put that resource here? Um, or why did she take, you know, why doesn't she have the one that I use? And we can talk about that and say, well, I, I, you know, a parent might say like, I have this video and I could say, yeah, I've looked at that one, but for me, this piece didn't, didn't fit. And so that's the kind of conversation that I'm hoping to have in the online um, sessions. Um, and that would be, of course, some of the conversation we'd have if you did like the, what did I call it? Like the do it for me type of one. Like that's where we would kind of come to an agreement of, of you know, of course I have my preference, but if, you know, if we, um, you know, see things differently, then we can talk about your preference and how you might frame the language um, in that, that uh, like where I do it for you kind of thing. Right, right. And um, let me put your link back up too while I'm thinking of it. And it should be in the chat also. Mm -hmm. um, and let's see. I'm so glad. I don't know how many people are here, but thank you. This oh, I know. Lot. Isn't it nice? Yeah. Um, Christy says, I have experienced as much, if not more, resistance to inclusion from special educators and general mm -hmm. educators. How interesting, huh? huh. It's been a, well, it, I would say it's the experience that I know because I, I wasn't sharing a classroom with the other general educators. So what I was doing as far as inc you know, inclusive practices in my room didn't affect the others all the time. <laughs> um, but the special educators, it's um, it threw them off because you know, they're very used to doing things a certain way. And there's a certain model that they've been working with. Um, and it's hard. I think a lot of times they, it's that medical model that kind of creeps in, whether they know it or not, where they right. think I need to take that kid out and do something to fix the kid before they come back in. And, and I need to do it alone with the kid. And, and there's, you know, we talk about there's resources for that as well. There's, a, there's an article for everything. Um, but that that is something I've come across a lot is like, I you know, I, my co-teacher, you know, was like, she's, you know, great. Love the kids more than anything. But was like, I just want to be in the room alone with them and just get this stuff done. And like, okay. no, no, no. Like we can do it together. You know, <laughs> so, and it's, it's a mind shift because you weren't trained that way. Oh, I yes, for sure. 
Yeah. yeah, and yeah, and I think it's hard too because for a lot of teachers, they like being able to close their classroom door mm -hmm. and just have their little community of kids, and yeah. you know, mm -hmm. um, and there's appropriate times for that, right? Because you mm -hmm. want to have that community. Yeah. Um, yes, but it's nice when we have more general ed teachers like you, Amy, mm -hmm. that are um, enthusiastic about including kids, and I know. Uh, as a parent, like you really see the amount of time and energy mm -hmm. it takes um, to change your way of thinking, to try something new, mm -hmm. but the rewards that you'll reap and that all the kids in your class will reap are just yeah. extraordinary. So mm -hmm. I am so glad that you could come on today and talk about this. I don't know. I'm calling it a framework. I don't know. <laughs> That's I, a correct I can, word. <laughs> I can I can start using that. See how it sounds. <laughs> um, and so Angela, she had asked a question earlier, so I'll just quickly go back to that. And she was saying like how her team is like so receptive. It's like she can write, you know, a lot of the language for the IEP. They'll say that's great. Copy and paste it. And I and I know some other families that have teams like that. And so. When you first hear, when I first heard that, it was like, yes, that's so cool. We just have to train more parents on what to tell them just right, you know. But then this parent who is a trailblazer, she's in my membership group, and she said she was talking to an attorney about different options. And the attorney looked at the IEP and knew <laughs> that the special ed teacher probably did not write this because it was so good. Mm -hmm. And she said to the parent, you know, stop spoon feeding the district with this um, language and giving them so much of the text for the IEP. Mm -hmm. And so there's a couple of thoughts I have, and I don't know this attorney at all, so I, I'm not sure, but one thought I have that I've run into as an advocate is I have attorneys saying, you know, stop telling them the mistakes they're making. Um, let them make more mistakes, and you know, and and as an advocate, it's like, no, I. Can't. If we can, you know, try to correct a course of action at the IEP team meeting, I want to do that. I don't want them to continue to make these mistakes. So I don't know if the attorney was saying, don't give them all the language because you're helping them. But the other thing that I think about is when we give them all the language and it's not a collaborative effort, mm -hmm. they don't have that ownership, right? It's like, great, I've got my IEPs done and I can file them away and I'm ready to go. Yes. And so I just, there's this fine line, I think, between how much input we give, you know, ourselves and how much we want to try to craft together. And mm -hmm. I don't know what your experience, Amy, has been like. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I did write it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was with the intention of like, this is this is what I want it to look like. Like I've seen enough uh, IEPs that I, if I inherited them as a teacher, and when I did inherit IEPs, I just didn't know where to start. And so it became a document that did just get filed away. Um, so I, yeah, like someone just, Kelly just wrote like how to fish, right? So that's, a, that's, that's sustainability. It's not sustainable unless you help build each other's capacity and know what a, a good IEP should be. No one teaches anybody how to write an IEP in school. They're just learning from whoever taught them, you know, and these, the practices that, that get, um, carried across the years, um, you know, and maybe they, they, you know, never got in trouble for them or never got called out on them. But, you know, it becomes like just a formality and not this document that I think has can be so useful and meaningful for oh. student, you know, and then really make it the I and IEP make that come true, I think. Um, you know, but if no, if they're, if we're not building capacity of ourselves and, and the team, then it won't sustain you. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. 
Well, I know we're a little bit past the top of the hour and I want to respect everyone's time, but this has been such a wonderful conversation and it just, I, I haven't used a prop yet. You know, I, I have to use at least one prop. So it's given me a lot of bright ideas and if it has also popped in your mind some new ideas, make sure that you tell your friends, uh, you know, have, they can come back and watch the replay. Um, you can also get in touch with Amy um, at connect at universalcrossings.com. Mm -hmm. And she can answer any other questions you have about her course coming up and the different options that you have. Mm -hmm. And th um, they need to register. Is it coming August 2nd? I was trying to remember the date. Right. So right. I'm learning I'm learning this new system. And what, what I set up is that you can pre-order now. And then it'll kind of be unlocked um, August 2nd. And the 21st, I might let it go a couple of days after the 21st in case people need to finish up or catch up. But um, cool. it's all it's all there. I, I just need to do the recordings, like I said. Um, right. Then, but it, it's up, they're up there now. Oh, good. So, yeah. yes. So go and check things out or contact Amy. Um, and next week I will be doing our weekly show on Tuesday evening because I'm doing a presentation for um, a Down syndrome group in Texas. And our topic is going to be how to market inclusive education um, and think like a marketer. So that'll be a fun topic to talk about. So I hope people will join us next Tuesday evening. I'll be posting more about that in the in our Facebook group. But thank you so much, Amy, for being with us today. Thank you, Charmaine. I'm, I'm over the moon. <laughs> I really appreciate this. This was great to come and hear what people are thinking and, and be with you, really. Yes, so it was great. And, and as people think of questions that come up later, like continue to add those to the post because Amy and I can come back and respond or answer those. So um, until next week, everybody enjoy your kiddos these last few weeks of the summer.